following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at karm.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. How are you doing out there? Um, hey, if you want to give me a call, all you have to do is dial 877 877- Two zero seven two two seven six. We have three open lines right now. You can also email me at info at karm.org, info at karm.org, and you can ask me a question there. Just put in the subject line, radio comment, radio question, something like that, and we often get to them. Now, tomorrow's Friday. That's when we kind of focus on those most, but uh, we'll see. Anyway, like I said, if you want to give me a call, 877 877- Two zero seven two two seven six. Let's just jump on. Oh, today's date. That's right, August fifteenth. Do that for the podcasters and stuff like that, because sometimes they need to know. And for strategizations, strategery, I think it's called. All right. So hey, look. Uh, let's get to Kara from California. Kara, welcome. You're on the air. Hello. I was Hi. the last caller two days ago. And okay. you didn't get enough time to uh, answer the question that I had. Okay. The question is this. Why was a man stoned for carrying sticks on the Sabbath in Numbers 15, while Jesus' disciples were allowed to pick heads of grain on the Sabbath in Matthew 12? Because in uh, Numbers 15, they were breaking the law. They're under the theocratic system there and are not to do any work. Heads of grain is not work. It is feeding, and you're supposed to eat on the Sabbath. But to carry sticks, uh, according to the law, you could do it a certain distance, but uh, not very far. The idea was not to do any work, because the the rest of the Sabbath ultimately represented Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, and the rest that we have in him. And so to work in that context was to violate that principle of our salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and what God has done in the person of Christ alone. So eating is not a uh, a work. It's not doing anything other than what is normal uh, for every day of the week. Okay, that's all. Okay, and it seems to be a also a question of what necessity is. Um, Jesus made it clear that acts of necessity and piety were allowed on the Sabbath, and I was thinking, were, was it possible that the man carrying the sticks? did so out of necessity, or in, in contrast, did the disciples really need to pick heads of grain to eat on the Sabbath? Well, they would need to eat heads of grain uh, because they're, they're eating. But the movement of sticks, you know, if a stick falls and in, in, going to hit somebody and you stop it and you move it and throw it away, that's not a work. Even uh, the law says you can take a... a, a cattle, you know, whatever it is, out of a ditch on the Sabbath. It's a lot of work to do that, but it's to save life, it's to make things better. And so that's the, the, the idea. What the Jews did back then for that kind of thing is they turned it into a super detailed list of do's and don'ts of righteousness. So by the time Christ came along, even to pick a head of grain, oh, you're violating the Sabbath, and they weren't violating the Sabbath. So it was what the, the Pharisees mistakenly concluded was uh, was that it was not wasn't forbidden in the law. Okay. Okay. Um, it was the uh, the intention of the man carrying the sticks it isn't specified in Scripture, and right. mo- many commentaries they state that he could have been intending to to light a fire, which would have been a violation of Scripture, mm-hmm. because in Exodus 35.3, it condemns uh, kindling a fire in one's dwelling place right. on the Sabbath. However, mm-hmm. couldn't that be an act of necessity, like to warm himself or something? Perhaps. But obviously the one who did that in Numbers 15 uh, was breaking the law. A lot of people think that just if, if your intention is good, therefore it's okay. And it's not always the case. 
Now, it does matter in the issue of law and murder, killing people. If you accidentally kill somebody, you're not to be held responsible the same way. It was an intention of murder. So intentionality does have a lot to do with this. In the instance in Numbers 15, an individual uh, was breaking the law of God. Whether you, you know, you, you know, I, I, uh, that was an illustration. I lied uh, uh, about all this and that because I intended to do good. Well, you know, lying is, is not justified, even in a condition like that. So we have to go with what the law of God says, particularly those people in the Old Testament had to. And so the man who was in that position was, um, was breaking the law. So that's just what it was, and he was in trouble. Okay? All right. Okay. I think so that's it. Okay, here's a, oh, well, a principle. Okay. This is a principle. When you come across stuff like this in the Old Testament, put Jesus there, put the crucifixion there, and, and see what's going on. It's like in Second Chronicles 20. A bunch of people were coming down to destroy Israel. They wanted to destroy Israel, and God said, that this battle's not yours, this battle's mine. And he wiped out the bad guys. Well, why? Because if the bad guys had come down and destroyed Israel, then there would be no Messiah. So that makes sense. Oh, I get it. So God intervened on this because he wanted to make sure that the people of Israel would continue and the Messiah, Jesus, would be born and we could be saved. So then you go, oh, I get it. And that's why he would say the battle's not yours, this one's mine. So when you put Christ in there in the Old Testament, when you have questions, you have doubts, put him in there and see if what is happening represents Christ. So if the man is carrying sticks, the violation on the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is a day that Jesus, excuse me, that God rested. Because right. he created six days, on the seventh he rested. Now, it doesn't mean he was tired, it just means he rested. And the Sabbath ultimately points to Jesus, because Jesus says, Come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Matthew eleven twenty eight. And also, in Genesis chapter 5, there's a genealogy between Adam and Noah. When you put the names, the Hebrew names, in English, you get a sentence. It's appointed mortal men, sorrow, the blessed God will come down. When he dies, it will come, bringing to the despairing hope or peace or rest. And so the you can even see there that the gospel message is in the Old Testament encoded. And the necessity of, of obeying the law was there's several reasons, but one of them was to show the holiness and separateness of the people of Israel compared to other nations. Another reason was to show that the law, it can't save us. This is why it says in Galatians 3.24 that the law is a tutor that leads us to Christ. The law is that thing that shows us <laughs> we can't keep it. Deuteronomy 27.26 says that you could do everything in the law. And the law is summarized in love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. I can't do those. So I can never fulfill that law. And that's the requirement of the law. It shows us that we can't make it by what he does, by what we do, only by what Christ does. So the law leads us to Jesus. It breaks us and it destroys us to show us that we need the gospel message, which is the euangelia in Greek, which is the good news. That's what euangelia means, good news. And so the good news is you don't have to keep the law to be saved. You're justified by faith alone in Christ alone. So, Numbers 15, the man on the Sabbath is working. It's like saying, but he's not doing it, but it's like this, this typological thing that he's trying to earn his salvation by doing good works on the, the pla in the place of the Sabbath, which requires none because it represents Christ's crucifixion ultimately. And this is why he was in trouble. So when we have someone who gets uh, something to eat on that Sabbath day for food, that's okay. You feed the sick, you help people, and that's okay because the intention there, the law, and the aspects of what you do is not to thwart the issue of the rest in Christ ultimately, but to continue our life and do those things. Now, if someone has to move a pile of sticks to stop a fire, to stop something that's going to fall on somebody, that's, that's permitted in the law. But it's not the issue of doing works and construction to make yourself better or whatever it is, make a home, make a bed, make a whatever, on that day, not to do that. Okay? Okay. That makes sense. All right. Well, good. Can I ask how old you are? Just curious. Thanks. You don't have to tell me, but I'm just curious. Yes. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right, then. Oh. All right, well, God bless. Thank you. All right. That was Kara, and uh, I enjoy those kind of questions. Good stuff. All right. If you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. Let's get to Peter from North Carolina. Peter, welcome. You're on the air. Hi. How are you, Matt? Pleasure to meet you. Doing all here. right. Hey, nice to meet yeah. you. Yeah. Um, okay. Question, I'll leave it with you. I really don't have an opinion one way or another. I'm just really curious um, from your um, biblical standpoint how to pers- how to understand this. I've been reading a book, uh, Imagine Heaven, from John Burke, and it's been interesting about near-death experiences and just all the experiences folks have had. Uh, and I'm, I'm, com- I'm curious about your perspective on... Um, salvation, and it seems as though when they have these experiences, uh, it contradicts biblically um, the idea of uh, accepting Christ before your death as opposed to after your death. Right. Uh, and it seems like many of them have some kind of conversion or some kind of experience mm-hmm. after death. So I was just curious well, what your thoughts were on that, and um, sure. I'll stay quiet and just listen to your answer if that's okay. That's sure, that's fine. First of all, there is a recorded NDE in the Bible, in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. Paul says, I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, do not know, God knows was caught up in, in, uh, into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. So it's a biblical. All right, so what do we do with these NDEs where people, um, they meet Christ, they see things, they have demonic experiences, they have all kinds of things. What we do is we judge them by Scripture. If they have an NDE and whatever state condition they're in that says uh, some entity says, oh, everything is okay, Jesus is just one of the ways to God, etc., and, and then it's obviously a demonic influence upon that person so we have lots of NDEs and I've read studied them uh, I've read a few books on them over the years and the NDEs are very interesting I like talking about them they're interesting to me but uh, I don't have any problem with them I do have a problem with uh, I should say this I, I do have a problem with them when what anybody says contradicts scripture then I know that they're wrong now what happens when you have someone who's an atheist, let's say, gets in a car accident, near-death experience, is attacked by demonic forces, uh, whatever it is, and then he wakes up, and he's alive, and he doesn't want anything to do with that, and he comes to Christ. Is that fair? Is it workable? Sure, no problem, because he has not passed over permanently to that position, that state. We don't know exactly how it works with people who are dying. The brain can be uh, alive for uh, minutes after breathing stops. Uh, you can be decapitated. Your brain can still function for a while until the oxygen you know, destroys the brain, or lack of, I should say. So we don't understand exactly the spiritual nature of how it all works. So what we have to do is just go with what is observed. And so uh, if a person dies, he's not permanently dead any more than Second Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, the person was permanently dead. So in that sense, comes back, receives Christ, and then he dies. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. And we have a break coming up. So hold on, and then we'll get your comments after the break, okay? Hey, folks, if you want, you can give me a call. All you have to do is dial 877-207-2276. We'll be right back. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. I guess we lost that caller, and that's all right. If you want to give me a call, the number is 877-207-2276. Real easy to do. We have wide open lines. So about NDEs, um, I, I enjoy uh, all kinds of things, and you know I don't I don't enjoy sports. I don't watch sports. I don't care about that stuff. I like documentaries and science fiction. I'm kind of nerdy, and one of the things I'll do is uh, read 
different kinds of books on different topics and uh, philosophy and quantum physics. I like uh, near-death experiences. I'll read about the occult, UFOs. Uh, to me, that's kind of fun. All right, so these NDEs. I've read varying stories of them and um, were people who have uh, died or technically dead on the operating table or whatever situation and they somehow make it back. And sometimes they'll talk about what happened. And I talked to a man uh, in Salt Lake City years ago. I forgot his name. And we met when I was down there once and uh, he talked about how he was shot and how he encountered things in the afterlife with God. He's a Christian, and uh, he survived, of course, and we were talking about it. It was really an interesting story. It was the only one I've ever met in person who's had uh, such an experience like that. And he says, oh, yeah, it, it's all real. It, it's there, and, uh, you know, Jesus is real. And so, um, NDE, so like I said, it's in Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, where Paul says, I know a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. So this is an inter interesting thing. See, this theology, or this scripture, deals with a couple of topics, uh, near-death experiences, but also with something else called substance dualism versus property dualism. Property dualism is basically what materialists hold to. It is the teaching that the physical brain produces the mind. So when the physical brain ceases, the mind ceases so each is tied to the other and the mind exists because of the physical brain so that's called property dualism which means that a mind of a person is a property of the construct of the physical brain now this is a problem and I'll explain why I'll get into other stuff I'll just talk because uh, there's nobody calling right now the other view is called substance dualism and that's what Christians hold to, substance dualism. That's the view that the mind, you know, the soul, the, the, the mind, whatever we, is, that thing we are, uh, is separate from the body so that when the physical brain ceases to function and dies, we continue on afterwards because we're a different substance. It's called substance dual to dualism. Property dualism is simply the view that the physical uh, brain produces the mind and so when the physical brain ceases the mind ceases now there's a problem with that so one of the things I'll do with atheists is I'll ask them questions and they're getting more savvy about this stuff and they don't want to fall into intellectual and logical traps so what I'll do is I'll say you're an atheist right and they'll say yeah it's okay do you believe in anything supernatural and then you know, they'll say well no there's no God no spirits no angels I'll say okay so then, does everything operate under the laws of physics in the entire universe? Chemistry, physics, motion, matter, all that. They say, yes. Then I got them. Okay, and I'll show you how. So then, that would mean, I will say to them, because now we're talking property dualism, that would mean then that the physical brain produces the mind, right? And they'll say, yes. And it means the physical brain must operate under the laws of physics and chemistry, right? Yeah. Can it violate those laws? No, it cannot. So then what you're saying is that one chemical state in the brain that leads to another chemical state in the brain produces, well, your thoughts, your intentions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a question. How does one chemical state that leads to another chemical state in your brain produce pr proper logical inference, logical thought? Now, at this point, they come up with all kinds of things. And all I have to do is wait and say, well, your chemicals in your brain made you say that. It doesn't mean it's true. Let me give an illustration of something. Let's say we're in a big laboratory with a gigantically long table. We have all kinds of chemicals and wires, electricity, and diodes, or whatever you, not diodes, but you know, chemicals and, uh, and wires and stuff like that. Let's do that. And uh, we have a source of, of current, electricity. And then we take two... two um, we take two chemicals, we put them together. Does that produce logic? Well, of course not. Well, uh, let's say that um, we have 50 chemicals. We put wires between them. Does that produce logic? Well, no. When does logic occur in, the, in such a construction? 
because that's what the brain is, is a set of chemicals that are interconnected, a set of neurons and electrical relationships that occur. How does it produce logic? How does it produce truth? How does it produce true moral values? And they can't answer it because it's just a necessity of chemicals reacting. That's all it is if it's the brain's under the laws of chemistry. Now, this means then that you can't know from that perspective, you cannot know if that position is true, if property dualism is true, which is materialism. Materialism necessitates property dualism. Materialism is that the material world is all there is. There's no God, there's nothing, etc. Okay. So then if the physical brain is nothing more than a reaction of stimulus, two stimulus, like sight, sound, taste, etc. And you, your brain is connected to the senses. The senses produce a lot chemical reactions in the in the brain. Those chemical reactions are just chemically necessary. How do you get truth out of all of that? How do you get logic out of all of that? They can't justify it. This means that position casts doubt on itself because you can't trust that your conclusions are true under such a perspective. And so therefore, when you have a position that refutes itself, the position is not true, hence property dualism is not true, materialism is not true. Simple. That's what I do. And uh, I have fun talking to atheists about it. And you should see how they squirm. Let's get to Corey from South Carolina. Corey, welcome. You are on the air. Corey, are you there? Corey? Corey. Okay, I'm waiting for you. Waiting for you to say something. I hear a little bit of noise, so I think you might be struggling there to do something. Um, maybe you can give Hello? me... There you go. All right. Okay. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing all right, man. I'm doing all right. So what do you got? I wanted you to break down the difference for me between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes uh, as far as why they didn't really like Jesus that much. Well, um, why different people can have different reasons for that, uh, why they wouldn't like Jesus. But let's go over the differences between them. A scribe is basically, his job is to copy the law. They're scholars generally because they're in the law constantly. And oh, well, we got a break coming up. So let me well, let's take the break. We'll get back and do this uh, again afterwards. Okay. So hold on, buddy. All right. Okay. Hey, folks. We'll be right back after these messages. Uh, please stay tuned. We'll be right. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, and welcome back to the show. All right, let's get back on with Corey from South Carolina. Corey, welcome. All right, let's uh, let's start this over again. Go ahead. So I was trying to get into the difference between the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees, and uh, what happened to them. Like, I know they don't exist anymore, but what happened to them? Well, they they were they were doing very well, popularly speaking, uh, during the time of Christ. Then the Jews rejected the Messiah, and then in seventy A.D. there was an uprising against the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire then set in sent in a lot uh, of people in an army and wiped out Jerusalem and basically destroyed uh, much of of what Israel was. So the scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees at that point then uh, were dispersed and the offices were kind of uh, uh, wiped out a little bit, even though there were still some who adhered to certain principles as they scattered. Okay? I got you. Okay. All right? Anything else? All right. Yeah? Uh, No, we good, man. We good. Thank you very much. (laughs) All right, brother. God bless, man. All right. Okay. All right. Now, let's see, next longest waiting is Rebecca from Salt Lake City. Welcome. You are on the air. 
Rebecca, you there? Hello, Rebecca. We're waiting for you. Waiting for you, Rebecca. Hi, Matt. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Doing all right. So what do you got? I've talked, well, I've talked to you before. I can't recall. It was perhaps some months ago. And I told you about my near-death experience where I hit a semi and where I was Mm -hmm. taking out my jaws of life. And I died periodically for about a half hour. But um, um, my brain, you can even see my brain, and part of it fell out, whatever. So I have extensive uh, um, memory loss. But I told you at that time that when I came back, I didn't see anything. And if I did see anything Mm -hmm. with my memory, I don't know. But I just came back with Mm -hmm. almost a smile on my face and felt very, very peaceful, a peacefulness I've never experienced before and have not. So I don't know. (laughs) Uh, So what do you say about that? Well, that, yeah. that's common. People very often uh, they don't they don't recall anything. I've talked to people who, oh. you know, and that's that's normal. It's within the okay. realm of, of what happens. Some say they see things. Okay. Some say they don't. Okay. Okay. All right. I thought perhaps I was missing something, but anyway, I mean it's true. And another thing that's kind of bothering my heart is. Um, when God, he gives certain people um, um, faith and other people, he grants faith and other people he doesn't. And I know he's a fair and just and holy God, but to me that seems unfair. Can you clarify that for me? Well, if it seems unfair, I can understand why you'd say that. But we have to have a standard of what is fair and not fair. The standard has to rest mm-hmm. with God. And so when people, I, I talk to them and they'll say, well, I don't, you know, God, it's not right for God to do that. Really? Who said? You know, where do you get your standard mm-hmm. from? So if it doesn't seem to be right, then you have to ask yourself, well, where am I getting this intuition from? Because intuition is subjective. People can have varying degrees oh. of intuitional awareness. And, you know, my wife and, we, and I, we've been married 36 years. And she might see something a little bit differently than I do. And well, me, I have a I, lot of intuition, and I can see things that are going to happen before they don't. And my mother had it, and some of my sisters do as well. Yeah, that that that's I'm familiar with that as well. Uh, clairvoyance, mm-hmm. as some call it, mm-hmm. uh, and then words of knowledge, words of wisdom. But yes, I, I understand. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So, uh, can you clarify that a little bit more? Why he would give some people faith and others not again, so I can really understand it. Uh, he does so to some and not to others because of the of what his desire is, and he doesn't tell us. That's it. Oh, so it's just unknown to us, and it's a mystery. It's yeah. He doesn't tell us why, because the Bible says he grants uh, that we believe. Well, why doesn't he grant it to everybody? Uh, people will mm-hmm. say, "Well, God won't violate our free will." That's not true. When you go to Psalm, I mean, uh, Proverbs twenty-one, uh, one, where it says, "God moves the heart of the king where He wishes it to go." And so, mm-hmm. people uh, that they very often do is impose on God a value they think is true. This is a mm-hmm. very serious problem. It's in the Christian Church. So we mm-hmm. have to judge what God okay. says. So God does according to His will, exactly. and you can read this in Romans nine nine through. 23. But it doesn't mean God's mm-hmm. arbitrary or he's mean or that he doesn't want people to get saved over there. And, and He has reasons that we just don't understand. And uh, so what we need to do is just submit to it and say, well, I don't get it, you know, because okay. think about it. He, okay. he appeared to Paul the Apostle. He saved him. Well, why mm-hmm. does he do it to everybody? Right. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he has, like, just uh, through uh, biblical history, he selected only certain people like Esther and uh, mm-hmm. the uh, right. uh, the prophets, you know, they were mm-hmm. all very Israel. special people. And I think Paul was too. Jeez, he wrote a lot in the Bible. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, God right. chose Israel over other nations. Well, why didn't he choose the other ones? Mm-hmm. That's, exactly. that's his choice. Exactly. If people don't have any problem with that, 
but they don't like mm-hmm. it when God chooses one person for salvation or to grant faith because they want God to do something differently according to what their system of thought is. And this is right. this needs to be addressed in the church and uh, rejected in the church. Okay? Uh, okay. I understand a lot more. Thank you for clarifying that for me because I know he's a God of mystery. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, well you have Good. a blessed day. Thank you. Yeah. You too. God bless. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Glenn from Virginia. Glenn, welcome. You're on the air. Yes, Matt. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. So yes, uh, my question is: In the first five books, how is it connected to Jesus? Um, very easy. And I'll show you. So what we can do is go to Genesis one and John 1, all right? And we can see the connection right there. So if we go to Genesis 1, verse 1, all right? Do this right here. I'm going to read it to you. And I'm going to go to John 1. This New Testament, right? Okay. So it says in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says in verse 2 of Genesis, and he, the earth was formless and void, and the darkness was over the deep of this, and this deep. The Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now let's go back to John. He, the Word, was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not comprehended. So we go back to Genesis chapter 3 and continue to read. It says, God said, let there be light. There was light. Verse 4, God said, saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. So you can see right away that the Gospel of John, the beginning, ties Christ himself to Genesis chapter 1 in created order. Okay. Now, I got one more question. And sure. um, how does, okay, now in the first five books, the people that I talked to, they said that that when Jesus died, it didn't line up with the, you know, the time, the time didn't line up to how, you know, the Sabbath and the, the um, his resurrection lined up. He said it didn't line up. So how does that line up? Well, when they people say this, it didn't line up. I'll say, show me the documentation. Don't just assume that what they're saying is true. Right. I, well, I, don't, to, I don't assume it. And yeah, I, I talk. And I, I, I talk to them. You know. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Ask. Ask them to prove it. Ask. Them, show me the verse. I'll do this all the time. Show me the scriptures and let's see. Don't assume that people who hear things down the gossip line and you, they repeat it to you, now you've got to answer it, refute it. No, just go, show me where it says yeah. that. Show me this, show me that. Yeah, or show me the verses, show me the scriptures, and let's talk. And if you don't have that ability to show me what it is, then you're just essentially you're spreading gossip. And you don't want to do that. That's what I'll do. Yeah, just, okay. All right. All right. All right. I'll go with that. All right, right, Matt. Appreciate you. God bless. God bless. All right. Okay. Let's see. Let's get to Jose. Yeah. Jose from Texas. Jose, welcome. You are on the air. Hey, Matt. How are you doing? Doing all right. Hanging in there, man. Hanging in there. Oh, oh, there's a break. There's the, (laughs) sorry about that. There's the break music. So hold on, brother. Okay. We'll be right back. All right. All right. Hey, folks, we'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. Let's get back with Jose. Sorry about that. Break timing there. All right, man. What do you got, buddy? All right, hey, I'm, hey, hey, Matt. Hey, man, just a quick question. I know this is a pretty heated subject. Um, with the upcoming elections, 
should Christians encourage the body of Christ to take a stand or you know to vote against the Democrat Party? Now, with me saying this, I'm not endorsing Trump. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying Trump is a Christian. None, nothing of that nature. But for all we know is that Trump is not on that side of that agenda. So, I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Well, it's a difficult thing. Um, so, in my opinion, I don't see how any knowledgeable Christian could be a Democrat if they know what the Democratic Party stands for because it's the party right. of pro-slavery back in the 1800s, KKK, uh, also in the early 1900s it was the KKK and Jim Crow laws. And now, you know, I talked to mm -hmm. Democrats about, well, we've, we've, we've changed. Well, the slavery issue is still in effect with them because they, they uh, enslave people through, um, through uh, giving them money, you know, welfare. Right. And uh, right. that are now dependent upon the state, the master, to take care of them. And that bothers mm -hmm. me. Plus, they and, uh, welfare is okay for the people who need it. You know, and I'm not knocking it. It's just it, there's way too much, and, and they need to get off off of it and work whenever possible. I, I get that. But also the issue of, of killing the unborn. This is ungodly. Right. Uh, pro homosexuality, pro LGBTQ, pro woke, all this stuff. It's insane. How could anybody who's a true Christian, true Christian, ever uh, support uh, the Democratic Party? I don't get it. Well, is the Republican Party that much better? Well, it is a bit much, much better, but it's still problematic. They're compromising. Mm -hmm. They have a problem. Now you got Trump. What do you do? Well, Trump, okay, uh, he's got some. He's got some problems. But when we look at right. Biden and Harris, oh my goodness, these guys are socialist Marxists, and they want to right. promote killing the unborn and, and the promotion of LGBTQ and the attack on Christianity and Christians and right. you know, right, 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 so right. many things. So what we have to do is balance our needs with with what they are presenting and with Scripture. So I, I offer this to people: What if you had an atheist, an atheist mm -hmm. who's running for office? And this atheist, guy or girl, call him a guy for now, let's say he believes in the Constitution. He does not believe in shoving uh, the LGBT, the alphabet mob mentality down everybody's throats. He let the states mm -hmm. decide. I mean, I'd be like, yeah, who is this guy? You know? And I would right. have no problem voting for an atheist uh, if he holds to the Constitution. But, right. so you see, it's, the whole thing is tough. It's just a tough thing. You know? Yeah. No, no, yeah, I, I understand that. It, it's just I'm seeing a lot of like Christians, especially my friends, they're they're very unbiased when it comes to you know like politics and church. I understand, right? You know, you can't mix two things together. But then we're th we're also thinking about the future of our generation with this mm -hmm. party coming. I think this party, I think Kamala Harris is more more liberal than uh, oh, Biden. She's horrible. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, so I, I don't know. Maybe I was thinking, how can we encourage the body of Christ? Cause, because I know in my church, people are not too, um, they don't really vote, right? Because they believe in, you know, they're, they're more of like, we're Christ-centered, we don't belong to no party, you know, we're, we're Christ-centered. But then then again, they complain about these, you know, groceries going up. But I'm like, hey, well, you have to also mm -hmm. vote against that too. So anyways, mm -hmm. I just kind of want to see what, what's your point, what's your opinion on, on how can we encourage, I guess, how can we encourage the Christians, the, the body of the Christ of voting you know, against the evil in the Democratic Party. That's what it is. I mean, and I used to be a Democrat too, to be honest with you, man. I used to be a Democrat, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, but now I see, you know, it's, it's, it's a anti Christian organization. So. Oh, it is. Okay. It's a horrible, horrible party. And I liken it to a, you know, a soft terrorist organization. Now you think about what right. the Democrats have, have proposed. The hypocrisy. I need to write a, a paragraph out about this. But what they've done mm -hmm. is, overall, not every single Democrat, but when their people were rioting and burning the cities, mm -hmm. you know, Kamala Harris is mm -hmm. bailing the people out who were d destroying, who are burning, who are uh, looting, and she would raise money to get them out of jail. What? Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? Uh, and the Democratic right. Party doesn't seem to mind when violence is there to serve their purpose and have you seen the videos of uh, the Democrats who hate Trump you can tell it and they don't have any problem with with lying 
with stealing, with destroying property. They don't have any problem with violence. They don't mm -hmm. have any problem with it. And the, but, the but. Republicans don't want violence. And so the it's like the Muslims. They know that if they're violent, they'll get what they want. And you can't right. be violent, but we can. That attitude. And so yeah. the Democratic Party is really bad. Really, really right. bad. All right, man. Well, hey, I'm, I'm going to have to go so that way you can take the other call. But anyway, thanks for answering my call, and we'll, I'll, I'll give you a call next time. All right, man. Well, God bless, buddy. Uh, okay. I love that. Bye-bye. All right. See, I have no problem talking about politics on on this. And, and if I was preaching, I'd have no problem talking about it, too. Some people say politics should never be in the pulpit. That is wrong. Yes, it should be in the pulpit because politics deals with morality. And God is the sovereign king of all areas of our lives, not just Sunday morning. Of all areas, we all need to be talking about it. Uh, Maureen from Raleigh, North Carolina, welcome. You are on the air. Hi, good evening, Matt. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Thanks for calling. Okay. Um, I'm having a hard time hearing you, but um, oh, okay. um, I, in the past, I've listened to your reasoning on baptism in terms mm -hmm. of sprinkling versus submersion, um, mm -hmm. and I thought it was very interesting um, mm -hmm. and uh, led me to think more more about baptism and I was wondering if there are any words that are supposed to be said over someone when they're being baptized. Well, it appears to be that the words that are spoken are something along the lines of, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what, uh, when I baptize someone, that's what I do. Okay. All right. That, that, that's that. That's mm -hmm. part of the part of the practice is is that those words have to be said. Well, it seems to be because what it but Jesus says in Matthew twenty eight nineteen. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So to do that, you, when you baptize them in the name of the Father, Holy Spirit. When we go, for example, to Acts 4-7, and we see what's happening there in uh, Acts 4-7, the, uh, the Christians are being brought up on charges and being challenged by the, uh, the, the legalists, okay, and uh, by the high priest. He says, and in what name have you done these things? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, rulers, you know, we help the sick, we help this, that, uh, that by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, by this name, this man stands here, if you, you know, we've done good, good health. So they're speaking, they're speaking in the name of Jesus, etc., etc. So this idea of speaking relates to the word of God, who is, in a sense, the speech, the word. And so we bind ourselves by our word, and there's power in our word, not in the positive confession, heresy, stuff from Kenneth Copeland and, and Hagen and uh, Joyce Meyer and stuff like that. So what we would normally do, and how it's been done through the centuries, is when a baptism occurs, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's how I've done baptisms. Okay? Okay. That's helpful. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. All right. We got any more questions? We've got nobody waiting. So you got any more questions about baptism or anything? Um, not not particularly. Um, you know, I suppose that that's that's logical, um, okay. a logical conclusion, um, and um, you know, I don't have any <laughs> no no argument. Um, but uh, I'll call back with, with another call that I have at another time. I wanted to formulate the question better. Okay. Um, well, but I, I do appreciate you. your show. Okay, well, and, good. Do you believe uh, that, that uh, I'm just curious, uh, should we be baptized in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit as a formula? What do you think? Me personally? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I mean, you know, I... When I've been baptized, I, I I was baptized, and somebody baptized me, my pastor at the time, and 
said in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know, which is recorded in the Bible, which which is fine. Um, and I just was wondering if you had anything um, that, you know, that was more dogmatic about the mm-hmm. procedure of baptizing. Again, I, I found that your, your reasoning about sprinkling versus submersion and the volume of the number of people was, was so great that they probably could not have been uh, right. submersed in, in water and that it was likely sprinkling. Um, I haven't really talked to many people about that, but, yeah, uh, I, you know, it, it's logical. It's logical. Yeah, so when I present it to people, they're really intrigued by it, and a lot of people are annoyed mm-hmm. by it. And so was I when mm-hmm. I first heard it. Like, wait a minute, it's always been this way. And then you start asking these questions. You go, wait a minute, that makes a lot of sense. And so, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's an issue. And um, I'm not trying to cause people problems, but I want them to think. I want Christians to think. Okay? Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so very much. Well, you're welcome. God bless. Okay. Okay, you too. Bye, Matt. All right. All right, folks. So generally, I do not quote church fathers or various things like that because they are not authoritative. They are not scripture. However, what I'm going to do here just in the last minute or so of the show is go to what's called the didache. That's the teaching. And this was written, the Didache was written by, uh, there's different views on it, but some say uh, between 65 and 80 AD, when the disciples, many of them were still alive. Let's look at the, what that it says in baptism. And just consider this, that's all, it's just uh, what it says. But concerning baptism, thus baptize, having first recited all these precepts, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in running water. But if you don't have running water, baptize in some other water. And if you cannot baptize in cold, then in warm water. But if you have neither, pour water three times on the head in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But before the baptism, let he who uh, baptizes and him who is baptized fast previously and any others who may be able, and you shall command him who is baptized to fast one or two days before. Oh, isn't that interesting? So this was uh, considered a practice within the first century. Is it the right way? I can't say it is or isn't because I judge it by scripture. The Didache is an interesting insight, an interesting look into ancient procedures. And they varied. Anyway, there you go. May the Lord bless you by His grace. We'll be back on here tomorrow. And hopefully, we'll talk to you then. May the Lord bless you. God bless you. Another program powered by the Truth Network.